On your marks. Set. So welcome, Holly, onto the Vinco Videocast series. Thanks for coming on today uh, to talk to us about your career in athletics. Uh, it's on quite a, a peak at the moment, um, and it would just be great to get an insight into you know what it's like to be at the top of the sport and the the journey that you've been on. So yeah, we'll, we will go back to where uh, where it all started. I think um, initially, but just to begin with, you've had a slightly slower start to what a kind of normal season would be. You missed out on the World Indoor champs um, for various reasons. If you want to go into them, you can, but is everything on track now? And where are you at the moment uh, getting ready for the outdoor season? Yeah, um, it was kind of an unusual period for me, but currently I'm like back on track. I'm out on warm weather training, um, having a really good camp, training's going really well. I'm slowly progressing back through the runs. Um, so yeah, can't complain, Got getting like my speed work back in, um, back in the gym and things like that. So yeah, currently going really well but straight after the Olympics it was um, a weird period it was just kind of transitioning out and like kind of um, debriefing and processing what happened um, I achieved something that I'd kind of thought maybe wouldn't happen I'd, I'd hoped it had happened but all through my career I've known that I can be a global medalist and I'd hoped I could be an Olympic medalist and to actually then achieve that was just super special so there was a lot of process that had to go on and then December and January were really tough months for me I had glandular fever but didn't really know it I wasn't like suffering you know I think there's a spectrum of glandular fever and I, I was definitely not at the really bad end just felt a bit tired a bit like demotivated a bit deflated and I kind of just put that down to dealing with the kind of Olympic success and it transpired that I did have glandular fever and then kind of trying to train through that trying to process you know coming into training feeling really tired wanting to train but being not being held back but being told you just need to go at a slow pace you know don't push it, it was really difficult um but yeah I think a lot of my friends and family supported me through that and after January was out the way, the January blues, I'm pretty, sh I'm, I'm pretty sure a lot of people suffer that kind of thing in January anyway. Mm -hmm. But once January was out the way, it was almost I could see the light at the end of the tunnel and got my motivation back, got my energy back and training just started to go a lot better. Mm -hmm. well, it will be great to kind of get a, a more of an insight into that whole Olympics experience for you and, uh, of course, getting that bronze medal. But um yeah, what's uh, on the what's on the schedule event-wise um, coming up? We've obviously got Birmingham Commonwealth Games. Is that kind of a, a big thing for you? And any, anything else going on uh, coming up? Yeah, so the big three for me are the World Champs, followed by the Commonwealth Games, followed by the Europeans. I plan on doing all three. Luckily, as a pole vaulter, it is possible um, to do all three. The Commonwealth Games is always a straight final, so that kind of makes it easy. Um, and then. The world's are two weeks before that and then the europeans are two weeks after that so i have enough time to rest recover do a bit of training before hitting up the next one so i do feel very lucky that kind of calendar wise all three works um and then before the worlds i'm trying not to like over compete because i i need to be ready for those six weeks where the three majors are that's five really important competitions in six weeks so I don't want to like spread myself too thin before so i'll do the british university champs in chelmsford in i think that's like less than two weeks now um just from a short run then i'll open at birmingham diamond league which i'm super stoked for the new stadium i just want to see what kind of like the track like what it's going to be like for the commonwealth Games. so that'll be really fun then i'll do rabat diamond league rome diamond league and then possibly one other before the british champs but I'm thinking maybe those those three will work well leading into the worlds. Sounds like a, a busy schedule, but um, has has that post Olympic side of things? Obviously, there's this kind of come down for a lot of athletes. Now that you've got through and past that stage, do you have this sort of added motivation? Because obviously, you've reached probably a life goal, um, getting a medal. Now is it? You know, you've done the big the big time, but is it now just enjoying it and and seeing what else you can get out of the sport? Yeah, it's exactly that. It's my goal kind of now is just to be curious i don't have a number that i want to jump i don't have medals that i want to win for me it's just being curious as to what else i can achieve i my lifelong goal was to break my pb 
Um, and I did that jump in 490 last year and to win a global medal and then to win an Olympic medal. Yeah, that's just ticked all those boxes. And, you know, I think I can jump higher, um, but if I don't, then that's also fine. Um, and I think I can win more medals. But again, if I don't, that's also fine. So it's just mm -hmm. a really nice position to be in to have opportunities to compete at major champs, compete for medals an opportunity to jump high but not have the pressure of every meet going into it thinking I need to do this I need to prove this to myself that I can do it and I think that's just a weight has kind of been lifted off my shoulders and it is just about enjoying the next two years leading into Paris and and I think having this year with the Commonwealth Games on home soil and um, you know the Paris Kind of, Paris for me is like home soil. It's so close. Like all my friends and family can drive to the Olympics. Having those two things in the diary are kind of what's kept me going rather than retiring. So that's, yeah, that's, it's nice kind of competitions coming up. And is that going to be, is Paris the, the final thing for you, the big send off or do you, have you not really looked beyond that point yet? Um, no, I think I'm, you know, 90, I'll never say never, but I'm 99% sure that Paris, uh, well, 2024 will be my last season. I think there's a Europeans after the um, the Olympics, so it won't be Olympics and start, but that, that season will pretty much, I'm pretty certain will be my last, um, which is why I'm just kind of, I'm not like counting down the days, but I'm, I'm seizing every moment, enjoying every opportunity because in two years time, um, my pole vault career will be over and I just don't want to look back and have regrets. I want to have enjoyed it because I've kind of got my two major goals done and parked. I'm not to, not to say that I can't achieve anything more, but it, it's just nice to know that I can kind of go into every comp, go into every training session, just enjoying it. And I think the last six months, I've really had to work hard to get to the position I am now because there was times in January where I didn't know whether I wanted to quit or retire. I didn't know whether I was still motivated to get up and train. I, I don't like the word sacrifice, but I put a lot on hold and I, and I do a lot of things to, um, to be, to be this, to be as successful as I am. And I don't see them as sacrifices because I choose to do them, but there are a lot of choices that I wouldn't make if I was a normal person versus being an athlete. So there was a lot of like mixed emotions in my head as to whether I wanted to carry on um, and kind of put my life on hold to do this amazing thing that I do. And I've come to the conclusion that I, I do want to carry on for another two years. This lifestyle that I lead is amazing. It's fabulous. And after the Olympics, it, this is a great opportunity now to just enjoy it and um, relish every moment. Mm -hmm. And do you have any plans, you know, post your athletics career that you want to go on to do any, you know, new goals that you have? Yeah. And I think that's why, um, I'm not, you know, I think a lot of people struggle with retirement, retirement and dread it, or what am I going to get, go on to, and maybe they just stay in the sport a little bit too long or because they don't have anything to go on to. Whereas my next chapter is going to be just as fabulous as my pole vaulting career. You know, the last 12 years have been amazing, but I know the next however many years I've got to look forward to are going to be a great. I really want to move back home to Lancashire, which is where I'm from. want to be surrounded by my family and just be able to see them, you know, maybe not every day, but, you know, a lot more than I have done over the last 12 years. I want to start a family with my husband and just kind of set our roots back up north in the northwest and just enjoy family time and enjoy kind of, a different chapter which i'm really really looking forward to mm -hmm. and being an athlete and you know the lifestyle is probably quite on on the road quite a lot how do you kind of deal with that sometimes there must be times where it's a bit oh, you don't really want to do it but then you know it's, it's what your life is and how do you get through moments like that yeah especially getting older um i've you know i just i like my own kettle i like my own bed my own <laughs> bed in I like my own just being able to chill out in my lounge and do whatever I want. And I think as as I've got older, I've definitely struggled more with the, the travel, which is why I, I've, over the last four years, I've tended not to go on warm weather training camps. Um, I like to be in control of what I eat. You know, I'm currently in America and the thing I'm struggling with the most is like the supermarkets. I'm like such a creature of habit. I'm like, they don't have what I want. And it's just very mm -hmm. stressful. Uh, you know, I am really glad that I've come away because the heat for me and my old bones and muscles is, works really well. 
but I think for me what what helps when I'm traveling is I I don't tend to over compete so I'm not you know bouncing around doing six meets in three weeks traveling to different locations I'm very selective with where I compete but I have some amazing friends on the circuit like Katie Najat and Kat Stefanidi who make travel really easy I look forward to seeing them I hang out play games we will chat over breakfast for three hours and that for me is something that I look forward to and that helps me um, yeah being away from my friends and family and my husband at home being able to spend time with them helps travel a lot <laughs> so just going back a bit to kind of your early days getting into pole vault it's probably not everyone's first choice to get into that kind of event what led you to that? Was there anyone around you which pushed you down that road or, or was there, were you doing different things within athletics before that, before you moved to the pole vault? Yeah, so I've always kind of been a really sporty child. Um, started football when I was four years old, then went into gymnastics for 10 years. Then all the way through high school, I played football recreationally away from high school, but at school, gymnastics, cheerleading, football, rounders, any sport that I could participate in, I would. I just... I just loved being active. I loved learning new skills, learning new sports. I was kind of one of those annoying kids that would just pick up, pick up around us bat and just whack the ball. So I kind of like enjoyed being good at sport. And then I kind of was transitioning out of football at the age of like 14, 15 into athletics. And I initially went down to Blackburn Harriers to do hurdles. So I would kind of train during the week doing the short hurdles and then at weekends I'd do competitions where my club had put me in the shot port, the high jump, the hurdles, the long jump, whatever. I'd just kind of make up the numbers in any other event. And I think it was um, George Davis and Tony Wood who were kind of like leading Blackburn Harriers who kind of saw that nobody was doing the pole vault like from any club. So if I could just get over the opening bar, I'd get max points and it was like an, kind of an easy victory. So I was like almost muggins here who wanted to try everything was just given a pole in my hand and told just get over the opening bar and, and, and that's your job for today. And I kind of like just really liked it. And they put on a kind of six week taster session course where they brought down a pole vault coach from the nearby club. And I was, I was there when, I mean, Blackburn, Harry, Blackburn is a, a very windy, rainy part of the Northwest. So it was very windy, very rainy, cold. And every week I was just there because I absolutely loved it. And it kind of just spiraled out of control from there because the coach saw something in me, saw my commitment, invited me to train with him on a full-time basis in Manchester. And yeah, it just throughout those six months i went from being a recreational athlete training once once a week to then training five times a week and pb in every week and whatever so it was a very it was more, more luck by than anything else that got me into the pole vault but i'm very grateful to blackburn mm -hmm. harriers because if they hadn't have you know shown me pole vault i don't think i'd ever be doing it and for those who aren't you know so aware of how, how it works and how you start out um are you just handed a pole and simply told to get over the height that you're given or is there a kind of slower process which you know builds you into it yeah i think that's one of the most common questions i get asked by like the general public or whoever is how on earth do you do like the first jump and yeah. it yeah what you see me doing in the olympics it takes years to get there like you won't even bend the pole for the first six months the way in which i describe it to kids or whoever is if there was a, a, a small river in front of you and you had a big stick that's how you start pole vaulting you run in you put the pole in the box and you just do anything you can to like get yourself onto the bed and it's the kind of the first six months is the process of getting more confident gripping up a little bit um, running from further back, running faster, and then that, that kind of combination of confidence, speed, and um, running from further away is what helps the pole start to bend. And then you can start to kind of like maneuver your body over the bar. But it is very a very slow process, but you kind of, it needs to be that way because you can't just come in on the first session with a massive pole and like bend and then like flip upside down. It's it, That's why it's not really scary to me because it is such a slow kind of, Little, little baby steps mm -hmm. and when when you kind of got going with with the sport yourself and you you know you've been doing it for a while was the olympics 
and just you know making it as a professional career was that something that was on your mind initially or was it just I like I love athletics and this is just what I do at the moment yeah it was definitely just I love athletics you know I'd love to say I had early memories of the Olympics and me watching it when I was like 10 years old and I was inspired but it, it really wasn't like that because I had such a background in football I was a massive Man United fan for me, the Olympics wasn't even on my radar. It was all about the Premier League and watching Man United play and whatever. So when I started pole vaulting, I didn't really know you could even do it as a job. It was just something that was really crazy, really fun. I absolutely loved it. And I think within the first year of doing it, within the first couple of years, I jumped four metres and qualified for the European juniors. And I was like, oh, like you can represent GB doing this. That's kind of fun. And then the next year I went to the European under 23s and the world juniors and things like that. And I think it was only about like two, I think I've been doing it for two years. And then someone was like, you know, if you jump this high, you can go to the Olympics. And I was like, okay, that's pretty fun. Like, let's try and do that. And then it happened. So yeah, it was all just a bit taking it in my stride and just, just doing it because I absolutely love it. And this crazy event where you just flip upside down was really fun to me. Mm -hmm. And when you're at competitions, uh, it can sometimes look, you know, from, from an outsider's point of view that you're just going and doing a jump and then you're, you're going and sitting down, essentially. Then there is, of course, I'm sure a lot more to it, mental preparation. And yeah, what, what are you going through? You know, you, let's just say you've done your first jump and then there's this time period until your second jump. What does someone like you go through in preparation for that second jump? Yeah, it's really interesting being a pole vault because you have this really long time when you're out there, you know, you, you go out there and you, you warm up for an hour and then I can sit around for two hours before my first jump. And it's, it's a, it's a getting that balance, right. Of being relaxed and not wasting nervous energy, but also staying um, hyper vigilant as to when you're about to jump, because you don't want to be caught off guard and be too relaxed. So you kind of just learn how to deal with that throughout your early, <clears throat> the early days of your athletics career. And, um, yeah, you, for me, I've, once I've done the first jump, then for the second jump, it's about going over to my coach. Do I need to change my pole? Do I need to change the stands? Do I need to bring them in, push them back? How's the wind looking? Is, has the weather changed at all? And it's like constantly evaluating all these variables because in the pole vault, it's such fine margins. And, you know, if I'm on the wrong pole and the wrong jump, then I totally waste an attempt. So I think for me, it's then just like assessing kind of what's going on with the situation and then I'll sit down, probably have like a drink or a snack, depending on how long I'm going to wait. And then for me, the routine is I know exactly, say like it's, it goes Kat Stefanidi, Katie Najat and then me. So when I see Kat kind of getting ready to take her jump, I'll start stand at the back of the row and I'll start preparing my pole, put some, you know, spray glue on it, make sure it's the right consistency on my hand. I'll then just maybe do a little stride to get my legs going, but I'm constantly like, you've got to be so aware of like, when am I on the run? When am I need, needing to get ready and things like that? So it is, it, it seems daunting when you tell someone who's never done it, but it is something that you just learn year on year on year of doing it. Mm -hmm. And so talking about, uh, we've, we've obviously spoken about the Olympics, but if you could give a, you know, a background and, and an insight into the whole, you know, experience itself um i'm assuming you were going of course you were going in looking to get a medal um so how did you approach the whole olympics of course we had lockdown and, and coronavirus delaying things along the way um yeah how did that you know um what did that you know create for you um yeah yeah um it was a difficult one because yeah obviously covid hit and it, there was a lot of uncertainty and being a UK athlete, I think it was quite strict. I think one of the most frustrating barriers and, you know, things that I had to get over during that three month lockdown was seeing other athletes around the world that who were my competition, being able to just go to the training, to go to their training centers and pole vault. You know, we were actually stuck in our houses and I'm pretty sure there were other people around the world who had it as bad as us, but it was frustrating being, you know, just trying to cobble together a circuit in my garden or do a weight session, mm. not being able to sprint or pole vault and then seeing my competition doing that. And, you know, at that point, the Olympics were still going on. And I was like, I'm at such a disadvantage. I, I can't, you know, I can't do anything that's going to prepare me well enough for the Olympics. So I think when they initially got uh, postponed, I was really relieved. I felt like it was the fair thing to do. 
um, you know, hopefully that would give us more opportunity to get back into the training environment and prepare better. Um, but I just tried to stay as, as positive as possible during lockdown. I did what I could. I had a really good gym set up in my garage. So I just, instead of my goals being, I want to jump a PB in the pole vault, it was, I want to rewrite all my PBs in the gym. I want to get super strong. Let's just do what we can. And that's exactly what I did. Every single one of my gym mm -hmm. PBs, I broke in my garage gym. Um, and then I think from then on, um, when we started back training in September, 2020 preparing for the olympics everything just went right for me i had a great indoor season where i jumped 485 won a medal at the european indoors we learned a lot from that but we kind of realized that the training we did throughout september and october and november and december worked really well it got me really fast i was pole vaulting great so we just kind of rolled that out again through april and may um and then just competed leading into the olympics and yeah, to break my PB at the British Champs was a great way to kind of give me confidence leading into the Olympics. And I think going into the Olympics, I knew there was five girls that could win a medal. And obviously there's only three medals. And I really did consider myself obviously one of the five. Um, I knew it was going to be difficult. There was two girls in incredible form. There was Kat Stefanidi, who was the reigning Olympic champion who you can never write off. And then there was Sandy, who was multiple um, global medalists. So I was definitely the underdog going into that. I was ranked fifth, probably, on chances of winning a medal. So when on, on the day, everything went really well and I cleared 85 and put myself in the bronze medal position, I just, yeah, it was just a dream come true. And I was just absolutely elated that I've been able to pull off something that I'd always wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And with it being a slightly kind of different Olympics, with there being no no crowds, um, a lot of athletes kind of feed off of that sort of energy. Are you that type of athlete or did that not, um, you know, bother you in any way? Yeah, luckily not. I've, um, I've kind of been on a journey where I'm a very controlled, process-driven athlete. Everything comes intrinsically from me. I don't jump on emotion. I don't jump on the crowd. And that's not to say the crowd aren't amazing. Like when I'm competing in front of a home crowd in Birmingham, although when I'm on the runway, I'm blocking them out and I'm just going through my processes. I know that their energy is there. Um, I, mm -hmm. and, I, and I do thrive off that and it's amazing. But I'm also an athlete that can turn that off. And just when I'm on the runway, I'm in my zone, in my bubble. I'm thinking feet down, tall at takeoff, feet down, tall at takeoff. I'm going through like my mantra. So I tend to block the crowd out. So for me, that worked really well, not having a crowd there. Like I, it would have been amazing to have a crowd there, of course. And I think one of the most upsetting things was my husband, my mum and dad had tickets to come to Tokyo and watch me. And they don't often get the opportunity to come and watch me abroad. And I just, I said, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. It'll probably be my, at the time, I thought it was going to be my last Olympics. So I said, come and watch me. I'm going to give it a best go to win a medal. Just, it'd be great to have your support. So knowing that had it happened a year earlier and the same outcome happened, they would have been there to watch me win a medal. It, it was very, it was very upsetting that they couldn't, but um, mm -hmm. on the whole, the fact there was no crowd and it was a very like, for, for the way in which I describe it is it was all about the athletics. There was no frills, there was no, um, no, no glamour it was it boiled down to on that day who could deliver the best performance to win a medal and that's kind of like what i love about athletics is how pure it is so for me it was kind of special but in like different ways mm -hmm. uh the pole vaulting uh community is quite strong um yourself and other athletes when you're on the diamond league circuit you're all a very close-knit group um how do you differentiate your when you spend time with them um, just personally and everything's all nice and then when you're going and doing actual competing and events how do you differentiate between those two and just kind of blank out the personal side of it it's super easy in the pole vault um when you're stood on the runway it's you versus the bar not me versus katie or me versus cat at that very mm -hmm. moment it's me versus 450 or me versus 480 and that that just makes it really easy to just still be friends with them like I will chat to Katie throughout the whole comp. Um, no, like, 
there's no malice. I'm not trying to put her off. She's not trying to put me off. I'm not thinking, oh, I want her to fail the bar because that doesn't really affect me. Like if she clears 490 and I don't, that that's on me. That's not, not on anyone else. And I have got to, I know, you know, I've got to a place in my career where I can be happy for other people when they succeed. Um, we're all out there wanting to do as best we can. And we all want to clear the bar that, that gives them the, you the gold medal, but that's just within your control. It's, it's, it's not within some, nobody else really affects me. It's me versus the bar. It's the only person that can affect me is myself. And I think I would much prefer to be happy for someone to succeed than have that horrible, bitter, f sick feeling in my stomach when someone does well and I don't. That to me, just that feeling that I have, I don't like it. So I, I changed that about myself and now I can be really happy and cheer people on mid competition because I know that it's, it doesn't affect me. The, like I, mm -hmm. I'm just there to, to, to me versus the bar. And that's literally how, how simple it is. And it just means that we can hang out and have fun during the competition as well, which of course is nicer. Mm -hmm. I've seen you spoken a bit about it on Instagram, how, you know, of course, it's the athlete that's doing the job at the end of the day and they're the ones that win win the medals but there are there are generally a, you know, there's a bit of a team behind behind the, those athletes uh who, who's been behind you and helped you along your journey yeah um i'm a big advocate of although i'm out there and i'm the one that stands on the podium and wins the medal there is a massive team behind me that have been there through thick and thin who without them i wouldn't have won the medal and i know it's I know you hear that a lot and it's easy for an athlete to say, oh, without this person, I wouldn't have won my medal. But I really do believe, you know, my husband has moved around the country to support me in what, whatever I wanted to do. There was there was no questions asked if I needed to move to Cardiff and if I needed to move to Loughborough, if I need to go to bed at 10 a.m. or eat really clean. Th yeah, through thick and thin, he's been there supporting me. And it's, that's the same with a lot of my family and friends as well. Um, just constant support and reassurance that keeping going what I'm doing is worth it and kind of they've always I've known that their belief in me to win a global medal has always been there and that's really really helped but then of course mm -hmm. my coach Scott Simpson who has been coaching me now for you know between eight and ten years has just been an absolute the, the massive cog in the reason why I've been successful and I think I wish that you could share a medal and I actually bought a replica of the bronze medal from China because he deserves the medal just as much as I do because he is out there with me, not only like in the training environment and, you know, if I'm having a bad day personally or if, you know, if I need to ring him on a Sunday, he's absolutely there 24 seven, whatever I need, whether it's sport related or not. And that for me is super supportive. And not only does he write the program that makes me successful, that when I'm out there jumping the bars, he's there, like supporting mm -hmm. me, helping me, whatever I need. And I always say that I can feel, but not see, and he can see, but not feel. So as a combination together as a team, we work perfectly and, and one without the other wouldn't work. And I think, yeah, I'm just very grateful for his support and what he's put into me as a person over the last 10 years to help me be successful. And it's, it's definitely not, it's definitely not just me. It's, it's a team effort. And just heading into my final couple of questions. Um, are you happy with the, the kind of state of British pole vaulting at the moment? Would you like to see anything different to make it, you know, is there anything that we could be done to make it more exciting and bring a different audience in, be that from a, a sort of event perspective or even from a broadcast perspective? Yeah, I think um, in terms of a few bits of, of your question, um, the pole vault, it's very, it's a very technical event. I think my coach has only just, he, he got employed in 2018. So we've only actually had an employed coach in the pole vault since 2018. And if you look at the depth of the event, it's there. We have the talent, we have um, we have the people that can succeed. We just need years and years and years of coaching and good education. And I think we're definitely getting to a point where we can have more depth at the top, which is very promising. I think in terms of broadcasting, I'd like to see more street events taking the athletics to the street. You know, you have maybe the elite competition on a Sunday, but then on a Saturday you have the elite athletes. So me, you know, myself and whoever come down, we run taster sessions throughout the day. 
um, where we get kids involved, we get them up on the runway, picking up a pole, having a go, just making it more accessible because pole vault just isn't that accessible in the UK. You don't do it at school. A lot of clubs don't have the coaching, they don't have the facilities. So I'd just like to see a little tour where we kind of take pole vault to the people. And I think that could be a way of introducing it and making it more exciting. And I think a broadcaster could just do a better job of showing the pole vault. Um, I sat down and watched on YouTube the 2019 men's pole vault competition and just, wow, it was so competitive. Sam and Mondo were back and forward. Um, Mondo was leading and Sam cleared on his third attempt. And, I, and it was exciting because I watched it unfold. I watched the story unfold and it was the same in Tokyo. If you watch the rerun of the women's competition, Kat Stefanidi goes into bronze and I'm pushed into fourth, but then I step up and I push her into fourth. And you don't get that with a lot of coverage because you just see, oh, let's just see the winning jump. And then this is who got silver and this is got bronze. And everyone's like, oh, okay, cool. Whereas if you, you know, we see a 400 meter race unfold, you know, Sean A. Miller might take over whoever and then she might drop off and that's exciting. And there needs to be a way to be able to show that whether it's split screen or pole vault only feeds, there could just be a better mm -hmm. way, I think, of, of really portraying the story. Mm -hmm. And my final question for you is, do you have any tips for younger athletes or, you know, maybe people that are in their later teens who want to try and take up the sport and see what they can do with it? Yeah, I think it's, pole vault is a super fun event. It's the training's really varied, which makes it not boring and, ex and it makes it exciting. And I think I would just give tips to anyone who wanting to try the pole vault, but in any sport is you know, I do this because I love it and it's fun. And I think a lot of people look at elite athletes and think, oh, they have to be really strict with their diet. You know, they've become robots because it's their job. Like, although it is my job, the priority one is, am I enjoying it? Am I having fun? That's priority for me. And if I am, then that's why I continue. If I ever lose sight of that or and I'm not having fun, not enjoying it, then I, I think I would just drop out the sport. And I think it's super easy to lose sight of that when you get into big races, um, run for Team GB, the pressure gets too much. And I think the advice I give is just remember why you started the sport. You didn't start the sport to be a millionaire or to go to the Olympics or to win a medal. It was because you absolutely love it. And I just think don't lose sight of that. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, Holly, uh, for your time today and giving us an insight into what it's like to be an elite pole vaulter. Thank you for having me.